Hello everybody and welcome to the Thursday edition of Video Clips and I'm going to continue today talking about this most incredible book of Dr. Campbell's whole Rethinking the Science of Nutrition. And I'm actually glad that so many of you asked me to review this book and come up with the talking points because it gave me a good reason to go back and read it again and um, I found just like I read China Study so many different times and I learned something new every time I, I did, um, I'm finding the same thing here that uh, my first pass through the book I got a lot out of it but I've got even more out of it, preparing all these notes for these talks. So anyway, in the second um, section of the book, uh, Campbell discusses a very important issue, and that's reductionism. And he's talked about this quite a bit over the years, but it's very important. And the difference between reductionism and what he calls holism, with a W, holism, W-H-O-L-I-S-M. Reductionists believe that everything can be understood by uh, analyzing and understanding component parts. Holists believe that the whole can be greater than the sum of the parts. And Campbell doesn't argue against reductionism as in we should never pay attention to it. He says it actually can be encompassed or folded into a holistic approach to looking at nutrition and health. Well, in the nutrition field, reductionism reigns. It is the primary approach to research and the understanding of nutrition. And you hear this all the time because we've all heard comments like um, calcium is good for your bones and vitamin A is good for your eyes. And Campbell explains that during his career as a biochemist, he taught this reductionist model of nutrition focusing on individual nutrients and their effect on function. The problem with this approach is that it's easy to conduct studies that show almost any result you want to show. And I found this fascinating. He actually makes the statement that given enough money and time, he could show health benefits for Coke and Snickers. And the way you do it is with study design. So you study the effects of Coke on people dying of thirst in the desert, and you study the effects of Snickers on people falling asleep driving at 2 a.m. And so, of course, given those circumstances, you would probably find benefit, and that's a lot of what goes on in the nutrition research field. As for how dietary information is translated into everyday habits, there are a couple dozen, you know, a few dozen vitamins and minerals, 22 amino acids, and three macronutrients, and we're told that as long as we get enough of these every day, we'll enjoy great health. And he goes further and says, you know, if we like a food that is a great source of a nutrient, we're happy to eat it. And if we don't like it, well, then we can just take supplements that contain those nutrients and, and uh, it'll be the same thing. But it really isn't the same thing. Let's take an apple, for example. The total apple is greater than the sum of its parts. In other words, taking apple nutrients in supplement form is not the same as if you were to eat an apple. Well, the government promotes this wrong approach to nutrition. They reinforce this whole thinking by requiring labels that show the amount of various nutrients in food products and by empowering committees to review scientific research to determine the quantities of each nutrient needed for optimal health. Now, nobody chooses their foods based on this, but the strategy reinforces the idea that it's the best way to understand nutrition. And this um, focus on certain amounts of certain nutrients is what motivates Americans to spend $30 billion a year on supplements and even more on fortified and functional foods. There are all kinds of problems with this approach to nutrition. One is, and I think this is fascinating, there is almost no relationship between the amount of a nutrient consumed and the amount of that nutrient that actually reaches destinations within the body. The reason is that the body decides how much of a nutrient to absorb and utilize based on its needs at any given moment, which it changes all the time. It will even restrict the amount of a nutrient that can be absorbed regardless of intake in order to prevent toxicity. This means that nutrients databases are virtually worthless and that taking large doses of nutrients can be useless and sometimes even harmful. Another confounding factor is that the nutrient content in foods varies so much and most important in terms of what makes a reductionist approach to nutrition inadvisable is the interaction of nutrients with one another which a reductionist approach to, approach to studying one nutri nutrient at a time just doesn't allow for. So calcium decreases iron absorption but carotenoids increase iron absorption. So how all these nutrients interact with one another becomes very important. Last but not least, humans could never have survived to the place where we could be having this type of an interaction if they had had to determine way back in the day how much of various foods and nutrients to consume because they didn't have any way of knowing the nutrient content of foods. Well, it wasn't needed. You didn't need a mechanism for knowing that back then, and you don't really need it now because when people eat the right foods for humans, the body will control absorption and concentration of nutrients carefully, and you'll get exactly what you need every day from the food. 
Well, it comes back to evidence. The issue is what constitutes valid evidence. Everybody out there is putting out studies saying that these studies will support any claim that they're trying to make. There are many forms of evidence, each with strengths and weaknesses, and Campbell divides these into two camps, the holistic uh, form of evidence and the reductionist form of evidence. One holistic form of evidence is ecological or observational research, which looks at and compares populations to look at what they eat and their health status. These types of studies produce correlations, but not necessarily proof that one thing causes another. And this is something that plagues the interpretation of research findings in all kinds of settings. One example that Campbell uses is the example that automobiles, increasing numbers of automobiles in a society, often are accompanied by increased numbers of breast cancer diagnoses. Now, cars don't cause breast cancer, so there's no gain for women to stop driving to avoid breast cancer. But the observation that there's some connection there should spur some type of research to determine the actual cause and effect relationship. And of course, in the case of cars and breast cancer, more cars are indicative of westernization, which brings with it a diet and lifestyle that increases the risk for breast cancer. Well, Campbell's study was an observational, uh, it, it, the China study was an observational study, and critics have mistakenly attributed Campbell's dietary recommendations solely to his finding from this research. But if you actually read the book, and I contend that most people that are criticizing Dr. Campbell did not read the China study. They looked at the title and thought it was all about the research he did in China and nothing else, but it actually was about so much more. And if you read the book, his findings and conclusions and his recommendations as to the right diet for people was based on so much more than just his research in China. That was just one uh, component of a greater whole. So anyway, I'll stop there. There's so much to talk about. We will pick this up again next week. In the meantime, I hope you have the book whole, Rethinking the Science of Nutrition, and um, announcement our conference this year, November 8th through 10th, here in Columbus. Dr. Campbell will be our keynote speaker, and he's going to talk about these issues firsthand. And I'm sure you'll find it much more fascinating to hear it from him than you are from me right now. So you're just getting the sneak preview during these little clips. As usual, pass this on to anybody who you think should uh, watch it. And I will be back to you again on Tuesday.